You're listening to RHR Talks, the podcast where the RHR team talks all things recruitment and advertising. We're going to be covering various topics on which we're regularly asked by candidates and hiring managers and offering our industry insight, which we hope you'll find useful, whether you're looking for that next opportunity or just to find the best talent. I'm Paul Walsh, one of the consultants at RHR. This week, I'm joined by my colleague and stand-in podcast co-host, Helen Osborne, as we discuss all things equality, diversity, and inclusion. We're joined in conversation with some key contacts that champion EDI within their businesses. We discuss why it's critical that companies take EDI seriously, how far we've come, but equally, what work is still to be done. I just want to say, first of all, thank you very much for, for joining us and for getting involved. My name is obviously Paul. Um, I'm one of the consultants at RHR. I've been with RHR for seven, seven years in September, which is crazy. Um, I know, Helen, you've got a few more years on me, so I'm not trying to uh, make it so long. But yeah, so I recruit for um, across the broad spectrum positions, HR, operations, finance, you name it. I've probably touched on it at some point or another. That's me. I'm based in the London office. I'm... Um, obviously working from home at the moment and yeah I work really closely with Helen. So yeah as um, Paul indicated I've been at RHR for a very long time so I think we're coming up to 19 years this year so and then I was um, a client of RHR before that. Again like Paul I recruit across the whole remit but why I wanted to get involved today is um, is because I do love HR and um, ED and I tends to fall within an HR remit, although it should be everyone's remit. Um, but yeah, I love um, love recruiting for HR. Um, and again, I wanted to be involved today because as well as sort of seeing things from my point of view, which is probably someone that's a little bit older than the rest of you on the call, um, I've also got two teenagers. So seeing things from their perspective as well as they're looking to join the workforce is, um, is really interesting to see how their views diversify from from mine, having been in the workforce for quite some time. Dan, did you want to just give us a, start us off and give us a bit of background about yourself? Yeah, uh, I mean, well, first of all, thank you for, for asking me to, to join you this afternoon. So uh, I'm Dan Foster. I'm the Talent Acquisition Manager for Triodos Bank, um, who are a uh, sustainable uh, financial services organisation, uh, Dutch in terms of our heritage. Been with them for about five and a half years now. Um, and so my remit is... I look after the resourcing function, um, as well as diversity, inclusion and mental health for the UK business. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Monica Stanko. I'm a diversity and inclusion manager at Lloyd's. I lead their internal diversity and inclusion and well-being agenda, both in the UK and globally. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Matthew Dutton. I'm head of people partnering for Charlotte Tilby Beauty. Um, we're a global luxury retailer of cosmetics and skincare. I've been with the brand for just over three years now, um, and I lead a really you know, generalist team of people partners here looking after all the EMEA regions of so seven markets um, and all of our corporate and retail functions. So yeah, thanks for having me in the conversation. It's great to meet you all. Fab. I just wanted to throw it out to the group. A bit of a bit of a broad question really is, you know, how did you get involved with ED&I in general um, and, and obviously within, within the business that you're in at the moment? I kind of fell into it, for want of a better phrase. Um, so I've, I've always specialised in recruitment and resourcing until picking up this particular world. And um, around about three years ago, diversity inclusion was really starting to come to the forefront. We were getting a lot of questions around DNI as an organisation. Um, it's something that's ingrained into our mission statement around having um, human dignity for all and promoting quality of life. So naturally, you would think that inclusion is is weaved into the dna of triados but i don't think it gave it didn't really have the opportunity to look at it in, in its own right and so for me similar to what helen was saying a second ago i felt that it sat quite well within my world you know i'm responsible for bringing people into the organization so for me i get that insight into the external world are we connecting with particular communities and if we're not how do we change our resourcing strategy to actually try and capture um, as diverse pool of talent as um, as, as possible. Um, but over the last couple of years, it's hugely um, amplified, as I'm sure we, we all agree. Yeah, definitely. So I've always been really passionate about linking um, social success and organizational success as well. Um, so I've actually started off um, by working in international affairs and human rights. Uh, I've worked a little bit... Um, um, at the United Nations, the European Medicines Agency, in their international affairs department. Um, 
Uh, but then I've always felt like, you know what, like I want to change the system from within. Um, and then I discovered diversity and inclusion. And this is exactly um, what we do. We're basically trying to make sure that everybody has the chance to progress and make sure that they have the career um, that is really reflected of their talent, their ambition and their, their hard work. Uh Gosh, I'm not sure I can follow that, Monica, but um, <laughs> I'm not really the United Nations, but, you know, in terms of the business I work for at the moment at Charlotte Tilbury, you know, it's built upon creativity, risk-taking, being entrepreneurial, thinking limitlessly, you know, being a leader of innovation. So having cognitive diversity is kind of a necessity. It is a necessity for us to thrive, and you know, that's the same for every business, but more so here. So as a people team and, and you know, co-leading the people team here, you know, we're working with Team Tilbury, as we call them, to continue meaningful change, um, positive change, to advocate fair access and opportunities because a diverse talent pool makes a better business. You know, you will perform better. Diverse businesses are better businesses. Um, and so, therefore, I'm fully involved. Yeah. And you, and you touched upon it there. Um, and I'm sure we, it'd be really good to discuss some of the benefits of employing a diverse workforce um, to, to the wider business. Um, what, what are those benefits? What, what have you found? I can start off <laughs> as the DNI uh, in the room, DNI person in the room. Um, so we know that there is so much external research out there that shows that diversity and inclusion is basically essential to organizational um, success when it comes to performance, when it comes to getting the best talent, etc. Um, so I think first and foremost, we have to recognize that you can't really have um, excellence without diversity and inclusion. Um, if you, you know, if you, as an organization, you're not able to make sure that a wide variety of people, first of all, know about um, your organization and the roles that you have available, you can't really say that you have been successful in attracting the best people. If your um, reputation is not great from an employer branding perspective, um, that means you're going to turn off a lot of people from applying. Um, so they will deselect themselves. So you're basically leaving talent off the table. Um, mm -hmm. Um, so that's not great as an organization. You want to be in a position where everybody wants to work um, for you. Um, the other bit is really around innovation um, and avoiding groupthink. Um, the, if you have a group of people um, at the table that really have different experiences, different backgrounds, then you are uh, more likely to come up with better and more original ideas. The research that I did um, um, leading up to, to this um, I watched a, a TED talk by a lady called Janet Storrell, and um, her statistics were that um, ethnically diverse companies perform 33% better across the board. And it was in America, so they said the Forbes top companies for diversity have actually got 24% higher revenue growth than other businesses. I think the other thing that I really liked, um, um, and I don't know whether this is an urban myth, but I've heard it a number of times, which is when... Um, Beyonce went to meet with Under Armour and Reebok and Nike, Adidas, etc. The rumor goes that when she went into Reebok, she looked around the room and said, is this the team that I'd be working with when she was looking at a sports range? And they said, yes, it is. And she said, well, there's nobody here that reflects me. There's no one here that looks like me background wise, skin color, anything. So she's kind of took a step back and went with Adidas in the end. It's really Look, And it's an urban myth, though, so it's yet to be confirmed, but I can, it's, yeah. I can imagine that happening, to be fair. Yeah, but, um, yeah. It's really powerful. And there's, there's loads of research like that, Helen, you know, in terms of demonstrating that organisations with diverse leadership and teams can outperform those that are homogenous. And, you know, I talk a lot about, well, first of all, I agree with everything that Monica just said, but also that direct link with inclusion, and talking about organizational effectiveness and how that is a kind of umbrella title for so much, you know, helping everyone live their values, attracting talent, productivity, creativity, engagement, life integration, problem solving. I read a great book on that in terms of cognitive diversity and that, how that can really help cover the blind spots and, and you know, problem solving in an organization. So I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree with, with everything there. I think one of the biggest challenges, and actually this, this leads quite all ni nicely from what you were saying, Helen, is that one where it really starts is thinking around the employer branding side of things because you know from a candidate point of view if i'm looking for my next role and i'm part of a, a particular cultural background or an ethnic minority background for example and i don't see myself reflected in your marketing materials or on your careers website or you know throughout all those sorts of avenues 
you've potentially lost those people already because you run the risk of them thinking, I'm not going to be for this business. I don't see myself reflected and therefore I'm not going to apply. So you've kind of lost a, a you know, a phenomenal group of individuals before you've even started. Mm-hmm. And absolutely, you can say the same for customer as well, Dan, right? So actually our customers, like Beyonce as a customer in that analogy that you're talking about, Helen, you know, what, can the customer see themselves? Do they feel welcomed? Do they feel represented in terms of what that brand, whether it's banking, whether it's, you know, retail, whatever, do, do they feel it as well? Or really yeah. them? Definitely. With your businesses in particular, um, I mean, how do you, how do you ensure you're, you're being a diverse and inclusive employer? What, what, what have you done within your role? I think, I mean, for, for me personally, there's a number of different avenues that, that you can go down. So for us, it was starting really at a foundation level and starting with the policy and the strategy. That was the that was the starting point for us. Um, and in terms of creating the strategy, one of the things that I was really keen on was to have the input from the business as well. So this didn't look like an HR exercise um, and this didn't look like Dan was, you know, coming in to save the day or banging this drum on his own in the corner of the room or something. It was very much around, this is something that's, uh, the responsibility may sit with me, but this is something that should be owned by the business. Um, and so for us, we wanted it to run in line with uh, with our business plan, which comes to an end this year. So we'll go into our second iteration of that now in January of next year. But we really thought about the internal side of things. So thinking around the upskilling for co-workers, line managers and the senior team as well. Um, but then also trying to think about the external voice as well. So thinking around... Um, uh, certain awards, accreditation, to really kind of cement our commitment to this sort of stuff. Um, because otherwise, again, you may look as though from an employer branding point of view, you could come across as tokenistic or you could come across as actually you're not really that bothered. Mm-hmm. I would say I see more of um, more of my clients talking about um, taking names off CVs before they give a short list or a long list to line managers. Um, so they, they're choosing their shortlist from a blind CVs rather than name CVs. I really liked that. Um, sometimes taking company names off as well. So they're just looking at achievements and um, experience. I like that they're doing that to people adding, um, you know, having to include sort of male and female in shortlists, et cetera. So there's some good stuff going on out there, I think, just from the clients that I'm dealing with directly. Oh, definitely. And um, but I, I really do agree with Dan, though, in the sense that, it's just so incredibly important that you set that strategic framework at the very beginning, you align on what the mission is, because, you know, we, and we probably all seen this from the sidelines last year, a lot of people kind of do the quick wins and, you know, like quick different initiatives that we can run over the line, maybe like blind CV. And I think that's a, you know, great um, initiative to do. It's something we're looking at as well, but um, you've got to really look at the whole picture because all of these things are so interdependent um, that actually, just focusing on attraction is not going to give you credibility or sincerity with candidates. They will see through it if you're not actually speaking to people in your own organisation, working on how you're engaging with different representations in your own organisation to help navigate you forward and make positive change. So I completely agree with what you say, Dan. I would also like to share something that we used to do at our previous um, uh, organization, the Royal Academy of Engineering. So for us, um, diversity and inclusion was not just about recruitment or HR. It was something that was embedded um, at absolutely every stage stage of the organization. So each team across the organization had their own diversity and inclusion action plan. Um, So, you know, whether you are in IT or events or comms, you have to think about how you can embed diversity and inclusion in uh, in your work. So not just about how you recruit people or how about, you know, um, how you welcome people in your organization or your working culture but you know if you're in events um, how do you make sure that um, everybody has the same experience uh, when they attend one of our events if you're in comms how do you make sure that your website is as accessible as possible that your communication materials um, are accessible and you know like they show um, people from different backgrounds different ages different ethnicities that sort of thing that holistic approach um, I think is um, 
really, really, really useful. And what I see at Lloyd, uh, which I think is uh, really good, I just started a few weeks ago. Um, but uh, what I'm uh, really impressed about is the the commitment that they have around diversity and inclusion, and the fact that diversity and inclusion, and actually the the culture piece, which includes diversity and inclusion, is part of their wider strategy, their business strategy. Um, so it's not you know a separate project. It's yeah. something that the senior leadership um, looks at and pays attention to. Mm -hmm. I like what, you, what you're all saying. So it's really nice to have all the, the strategy. I really like the fact that every department has an action plan. I think that would really embed it into the culture, wouldn't it? Because we talk a lot about it from a recruitment perspective and then naturally because we're, we're recruiters, um, but it, it does go beyond that. Have, have any of you had got any examples around how you've had to I guess, speak to, you know, senior leadership and then really get their buy-in to understand the importance of, of, of this topic. I think for me, it was when, when I went back to the beginning and was putting in our first strategy, we wanted to think about how we get that engagement across the organisation. So actually, from a senior leadership point of view, I spent time with all of the relevant heads of department trying to understand their views on diversity, um, their thoughts on it within their team, um, and from their perspective, what is what's the importance of that? Because in banking, there's you know there's a, it, it's predominantly a white male orientated sector, and so for us, there are a lot of areas where where, where we are lacking in representation. One of the things that we do really well in my particular business is gender representation right across the business, but actually, in, uh, but as a whole, one of the development areas for us is around ethnic representation, and so. I was trying to spend time with the team team to get their insight, but also to try and teach them what their role is within this as well. So as the white heterosexual male, I still have a role to play in terms of influencing the conversation and trying to take that forward a little bit as well. So we really tried to get them to think about what their role is within this at the same time. I think um, the last year was really useful for diversity and inclusion um, with Black Lives Matter movement and um, what's been uh, happening with flexible working and more people embracing flexible working. I think the conversation around diversity and inclusion has moved on. And uh, luckily, we don't have to spend that much time talking about the business case for diversity and inclusion. More people get it now and they want to do more um, about it. But I think in those situations when they don't get it, one of the, the things that you can um, do to convince them that this is something that they need to pay attention to is, first of all, you know, bring your uh, data with you. Um, like we've talked earlier, there's so much research out there. And you can also use your own internal data, you know, your diversity data stats, if you have them, your engagement statistics as well, because that can tell you where you are as an organization and that is the proof that you need, that you actually need to do something uh, about it. And there is no organization out there that is perfect. Mm -hmm. We're all on a journey, as we say, in diversity and inclusion. But the point is, we all want and we all should be doing better and better. So use your internal and external data and then tailor your business case to match the, you know, the needs of your uh, organization and uh, of your sector. So for instance, when I, I was working in the engineering sector, uh, it was all about innovation and um, also inclusive design because uh, engineers build things for everyone and everyone needs to use them, right? Diversity and inclusion needs to be something that they, they have to think about. Out. In pharma as well, um, when you test out a different drug, they have different um, um, effects on, on women versus men. Um, so again, that's something that they need to think about and take into consideration. So yeah, so tailor, tailor your business case to, to the needs of your organization and your sector. Living with two uh, feisty teenagers, um, I think, you know, it's really interesting to see them as consumers and customers because they won't they won't accept any other way, if that makes sense. So, you know, they're demanding that people are more equal and, you know, as girls that, um, you know, they're being catered for as well as, you know, as well as the boys, if you like. One of them's a budding engineer, so um, she's a very male dominated environment. But yeah, I think they've got a very different attitude, whereas it was probably more accepting in you know, when I was entering the workforce, they they won't, um, both as customers and future employees. 
I mean, I've definitely seen a huge amount of change in looking at it from a, a, a consumer perspective, just in terms of marketing, um, whether that be as an employer brand or or looking to attract the right customer. Um, it might be interesting, actually, for you, Matthew, I know with cosmetics, for example, there's actually been a lot more marketing tailored towards male customers um, that perhaps would never have been the case looking back even 10 years ago. So it, it, you can see how it has evolved um, in, in that short amount of time. It would be really interesting to hear about perhaps some areas of inclusion that you're currently focusing on or even perhaps have found a little bit more challenging than others? I mean, we've still got a lot of work to do and we're so lucky to have such a vibrant and amazing committee um, of internal people who are really helping us not only set our North Star but also navigate us forward and help us be nimble to the feedback within the organisation. But there's some amazing things happening out there. I know Helen just referenced some before a minute ago, uh, but looking at anonymised CVs, overcoming algorithmic bias, you know, in our um, applicant tracking system that we use, catering, you know, your employee value proposition, such a really important and powerful thing, um, you know, that a candidate can really feel and see the inclusion as real before they commit to you as their next employer and the next step in their career. Um, and another thing we're really kind of keen to do is to champion the diversity of leadership as well. So, you know, if you have got a diverse leadership um, executive team, you know, to talk about it and to really champion it. I mean, we are so proud to be led by a female founder and a female CEO and to have, you know, 89% female representation on our exec team. Um, but then at the same time, and it kind of getting to your point that you just made um, then, is a lot of candidates just see us as a sexy uh, brand that sells lipsticks, when actually we've got a killer, kind of stellar tech, um, e-com, engineering department where we see kind of a real mixed demographic and actually a lot more kind of male representation in our, in our organization as well. And a candidate really needs to see that, and you can really do that through you know, your social footprint, but also your value proposition. And using kind of more diverse routes to markets, that's something that we're really kind of getting so welly at the moment. Like actually, how can we tap into more pools than what's just on LinkedIn and what is already coming to us organically? And how can we maybe partner with some external men mentorship programs as well? Because I think it's really key that everybody is thinking about youth unemployment. I think it's up by 11 or 14% um, just at the end of last year. And coming out of the COVID crisis, like how do we make sure that we are giving as much access to employment, but also for under, uh, you know, misrepresented people in society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was an interesting article yesterday actually in the news about youth unemployment. It was looking at um, young black people, 16 to 24 year olds, compared to white workers of the same age, and actually 41.6% of 16 to 24 year old young black people are unemployed whereas it's only 12.4% for white um, 16 to 24 year olds. That was statistics from October to, Dece just October to December 2020. And that had gone up by 17% for white youth, um, but 64% for black youth. So actually they're really bearing the brunt of the pandemic and the economic crisis. And yeah, it'd be really interesting to see what employers are doing to help that statistic. It's, it's, it's definitely a challenge within our sector. You know, financial services is, is historically and predominantly white. And so ethnic representation is is a challenge for for us. Um, and one of the other areas that I'm and, and my head of HR, who's my line manager, are really passionate about is around social mobility. Um, and so for us, one of the areas that we've looked at at the moment to try and combat the two is... Because of our size, we're not big enough for, say, a graduate programme, um, but we're also an apprenticeship levy paying employer. And we also want to capture students in the university bracket. So actually what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to evolve our apprenticeship and our placement student offering by partnering with specific universities with a high demographic um, of diverse students. But from an apprenticeship point of view, what we're looking to do is partner with specific charities across the city um, that tailored to those from more disadvantaged backgrounds, lower participation, neighborhoods, maybe ethnic representation from a, uh, a teenager point of view, um, as our candidate source and pool to bring in via our apprenticeship program. So we're going to try and create those opportunities across the city by partnering with specific charities. Bad. Great. One, of, one of the areas that I did want to cover, actually, was um, it was just a question to the group, um, I guess, do you, does the business do any unconscious bias training or 
just I guess do you agree that it should be replaced with the resources to advance sort of equality within the workplace as some people have suggested what what are your views around that so I know there's been some controversy um, around using unconscious bias and whether uh, training and whether or not it's actually um, effective I think it's um, it's all down to how good the training is not whether or not it's a, a training on unconscious bias um, and we also have to recognize that one training, no matter what the topic that it's focusing on, um, it's not going to fix everything. So the purpose of uh, an unconscious bias training uh, is just to you know, raise awareness about what unconscious bias is, how it affects your uh, decision making um, and um, how you select people. And hopefully if it's a good training, give you some, some tips on how to actually trick your brain. <laughs> Uh, to um, avoid unconscious bias, but it's not going to fix everything. It's it's basically part of, of um, a puzzle or of, or of um, a series of activities that you should be doing to advance diversity and inclusion in your organization. But if you, yeah, I agree that if you just rely on on one hour training, you're not going to get far. Absolutely. Um... I personally think there's still a place for unconscious bias training. You know, I've delivered it personally. I think it can be the richness of the training is very important because, you know, it can be so powerful when you're in the room and you have that that wide eye moment and you see that collision between um, perception, you know, self perception and reality. But it is just one tool in the toolkit. You know, you can't run unconscious bias training in solitude if you want systemic transformation or change in the culture it's important that you work so much harder than that and you go beyond just bias training totally agreed monica yeah i i agree as well i don't think i think i i agree i think unconscious bias training still has a role to play but i don't think it's the only piece of the jigsaw you know if you're going to we, we made a really conscious decision to think about well do we do unconscious bias training or actually do we weave it into our edi training so it forms part of a bigger program um overall so when we launched our management development program edi training was was the first fundamental module that managers had to attend before going to uh, before going to other sessions as well but we are looking at how we introduce say um training for all co-workers but rather than just capturing everyone in the first instance it's about how you follow up on that as well so do you do sort of annual refreshers how do you capture new starters as well etc as well so people realize that this is here to stay and you're not being tokenistic I think, as Monica mentioned before, it is very much a journey for a lot of businesses, and it's it's a focus point, and it's an ongoing thing. Um, how would you say that your your backgrounds and experience have prepared you to be as effective in this environment that holds, you know, EDI as as its core value? I mean, what what was it? What what have you taken from your own backgrounds to make you so effective in your roles? I think Monica touched on something earlier, which is um, or I think all of us have probably, where you want to you want to work somewhere that reflects your values. Um, and you want to, you know, you want to work somewhere that there's people that look like you. Like, I really like the fact that when I um, joined RHR, there was a female board member. Um, Bex Geegan was on the board when I joined. And it was really nice. And it was her that I would naturally gravitate to for advice and um, and that sort of thing. Having that is just so important for everyone. Um, and I think possibly I was doing that subconsciously as well, not consciously, if that makes sense. So it is, you know, just to have that representation there, whether you're acknowledging that or not is important. I think for me personally, my my interest in this really started when I um, when I was studying my degree. So I did my degree in sociology. So there was a lot around uh, systemic issues, uh, individual, how we interact with each other, uh, racism, education, LGBT, etc. So I've always had a really, really keen interest in this in this world. And I think then that that really became amplified when they're moving in house and joining an HR function because the more questions you would get around um, gender representation or ethnic representation they naturally started to come to the resourcing team because we're the people that are bringing people into your organization and so that started to to amplify a little bit for 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 me I think for me personally being a member of the LGBT community I've always had a really strong um, interest in that side of the inclusion world and I think then that started to bleed into the other areas of inclusion through organizations I've worked for volunteering I've done in my personal life um, etc yeah I love that really similar for me actually as well you know I started my 
um, my university studies and then my, my early career in the law, you know, in commercial conveyancing and worked in firms which were all white male um, for years. And even my first HR role, you know, it was predominantly white males. And um, yeah, I, I hid my true self for a long time. You know, I was a gay man and I thought that was normal. Um, and it was only then when I kind of penetrated the retail sector and, you know, I started to work for Superdrug, it's a fantastic company, part of the AS Watson Group, and really started to see diversity and, you know, particularly females in leadership positions. And for the first time, you know, I really started to appreciate how that impacted the climate of decision making and discussion. And then I just became an advocate of that forevermore. Um, but above all, you know, I'm passionate about EDI because it's the right thing for our business and society. Um, and to your point, Helen, you know, if you don't see that in a business, you don't see that shared passion mm -hmm. for the yeah. right thing for society it can be really damaging in terms of for that business and that person's decision to maybe join them or not. I think I was very fortunate, really, in the two businesses that I worked for. So my background was in retail management with Topman and Topshop. Started there when I was at uni, progressed with them, um, and then moved to RHR. So I've only ever really worked two places, but two places that were just by nature incredibly diverse in the workforce that they, they um, employed. You know, myself as a gay man, um, never felt that that was um, necessarily an issue because I wasn't working with other people uh, who were also part of the LGBT community. So I'm quite fortunate in that respect, but then it's not to say that it doesn't happen with other businesses. So perhaps I've just been quite lucky that the employers I've been involved with have always seemed to value that. You know, moving forward and, and what the big bigger picture is, um, you know, what, what changes would, would you like to see within the wider workplace market to ensure that we continue to move in the direction that we are because, you know, it's not perfect and there's a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of work already has been done. So what changes do you want to see? Um, so I think one of the things that I would really like to see is um, uh, senior leaders taking more um, responsibility and being more accountable for what they do around their risk and inclusion. Because at the end of the day, they set the, the tone. And if they... If they be, lead by example if they role model behaviors that are inclusive then everybody else will follow as well i think for me that's uh, that's the number one thing that i would like to see and two i would like to um see more the conversation around dni being also around um, intersectionality because uh, at the end of the day we are not just one identity we are as individuals, we're quite complex. Uh, I'm a woman, I'm an immigrant, I'm a Romanian. Uh, when I walk in a room, I'm not just one thing, I'm several things at the same time. Um, and those things affect how people see me, um, the, the access that I have, um, the information that I receive, etc. cetera. So um, I think intersectionality is really, really important. I would I would agree. I think one of the one of the things I'd love to see moving forward is for people to feel brave enough to have these uncomfortable conversations. You know, there's a lot of people I think are quite reserved in terms of talking about diversity inclusion because it comes from a really good place, but they potentially don't want to offend people. Um, and what I want to see, especially starting with senior leaders, so I absolutely agree with Monica. I want people to feel empowered to feel that they can ask questions from an inquisitive side of things and really want to learn and better themselves by having those conversations despite whatever your background. I agree with everything that said. I suppose the only thing I would add as well is one thing that really sticks with me, um, you know, and links to, to gender pay gap as well, is around you know, regular reviews of pay differentials. And, you know, the Salesforce story that I'm sure everyone's heard about, you know, about 10 million pounds to close the gap. And actually, it's still not solving a problem, uh, which has been around for a long time. So actually, how do, how do all businesses dig deeper to root cause and understand actually what, what are the real actions that can be taken to support gender, but also support minorities so that actually everybody is kind of getting equitable job design and compensation practices. Um, I'd love to see a little bit more about that and something I'm really keen to look at for us as well. And I think one I, of the things that we're really proud of at RHR is our yeah. income pay set. Of, of I know what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've literally been on, uh, I think with Personnel Today, we had uh, an article in there with um, literally like a, 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 a snapshot of a number of us from RHR and everyone's salaries, including our MDs, because everybody knows what everyone's paid. So there's, no gender paid because of that, you know. So it's yeah. um, 
it's uh, but it's quite unique, I think, um, yeah. across the working world. Yeah, and I didn't realize how. Um, if I'm being honest, I didn't realize how unique that was at the time because I remember I just joined the business and got dragged upstairs to have my picture taken for some magazine. I was thinking, what, what what's what's going on? Here's your piece, <laughs> like an A3, just hold it up. But, um, mm. but it, the, you know, the benefit of that was like some of the areas we touched on specifically around. Well, just around honesty, around pay scale uh, as a whole, but actually addressing some of the things like the gender pay gap and so on. We've had a very transparent culture around what those pay scales look like with the view that if somebody feels that they're not being um, compensated in the right way, then that's an open discussion that we can have. And um, that is quite groundbreaking, I think. And uh, I don't think I've heard of anyone else doing that, but it's um, yeah something I'm quite proud of um, for, for, for our HR as an employer to be able to do. I really agree with that. So at the Royal Academy of Engineering, they have done um, a study where they looked at um, several engineering companies and they wanted to, first of all, see what the gender pay gap is for engineering, engineering, but also see what are the organizations that are doing really well uh, that have a, a a smaller gender pay gap, and what exactly did they do uh, that led to that? Um, and salary transparency was one of the things that um, they had in common, salary transparency and flexibility. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting. I think the only thing that, uh, that, that, um, that springs to mind for me that perhaps we didn't talk about earlier was when you, depending on where an organization is in its journey and in inclusion, I think it's right to recognize what you're doing right as well. I think when we do look at this world, we always focus on the things of, oh, we don't have enough of representation of this particular background or of this individual. We don't see X, Y, and Z. And actually, if you are doing certain things well, um, then it's about shouting those and about those and maintaining those and building on that as well. So I think many organizations, myself included, really gave ourselves a hard time when we started to look at this and go, oh my gosh, we're so awful because of X, Y, and Z. But actually, you need to think about, well, hang on, we're actually really good at A, B, C, D, E, and how do we keep that going? And then, as Monica said, it's um, the pandemic's been awful, but you know, one of the good things is it's shown that people can work from home really effectively. And I think, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, I know during my time at RHR, I've gone from working full-time to part-time, from full-time to part-time, depending on, you know, having where my kids were at nursery or where they were at school. But if I hadn't had that flexibility as a mum, I probably would have had to leave when my kids were younger. But because I had that flexibility of being able to work shorter hours or work from home, um, it's enabled me to stay within the business. So I think, you know, having that um, available to me as a working mum has been an enormous benefit. But I think that a lot of companies have realised that a lot of people can work from home really well and are willing to give that flexibility. And that's been shown in the briefs that we've been getting from clients since, um, since Corona started. Yeah. I, I, Helen, you'll probably remember this. I know I've heard our managing director talk about this. Didn't they have almost like a crash upstairs in one of the London offices for people who uh, had children? I'm sure that they, um, I don't think there's many people who have kids now who work in London, but yeah, that was just another way of giving people that flexibility so they were able to work without having to explore options outside the business. Yeah. Anyone else got anything that they want to add that they feel like we haven't? I'm, I'm super conscious that it's a very broad topic and there's so many facets and elements to it. And I think the purpose of this was to just have a general conversation around the impact that you feel that you're able to have in your role. I think, uh, you know, I don't have an abundance of things to talk about this, but I would be really interested if I can take the moment with Dan and Monica as well, just to kind of know your, you know, your stance and feelings on targets as well with EGI, kind of how you use targets the importance to kind of your organization, how you use them, et cetera. I know that at Lloyd's, they do have internal targets, um, but I don't know too much detail about it <laughs> because I just started. Uh, but generally speaking, as a DNI professional, I, I am a fan of targets. Um, I think that it's important to um, set targets just like for any other business strategy that you have in your organization. Um, and of course, those targets need to be informed by where you are uh, um, as an organization and your data. So there is no point in setting a target of, you know, having 25% of your uh, leadership being represented by women when your data already tells you that um, you have that. <laughs> um, so that's why it's important to actually uh, invest uh, the time and energy getting as much data as possible. 
what gets measured gets done, as they say. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say that. That's one of my old boss's favourite phrases. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, I like that in terms of, you know, the measurement is important. And I think your point about moving the target to continuously strive for more, I really, really connect with as well, provided that, you know, then targets have to be met in an authentic and true way. Um, because if we don't understand and delve to that root cause as why the target is not met, you know, are we looking in the right places? How do we find different candidates, you know, for example, um, then it could, you know, it could be seen as performative and actually that's not there. That's not why the target is there in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I, I would very much agree with Monica. I'm, um, you know, I'm a fan of targets because then you don't know what you're striving to, to achieve, um, so to speak. But I also think it's about making it realistic at the same time. And there's, I mean, we all know that there's so much data out there that even if your HR system doesn't track a particular part of inclusion that you want to look at, then, there, then there's numerous areas that you could benchmark yourself against. Um, so the challenge for me has been that our HR system doesn't track um, ethnic origin. And so for me, trying to think about, okay, well, how what do we give ourselves as a baseline? We've used... Um, the most recent employment by sector report on the Gov UK website, but also the Bristol census. Um, so then when we're looking at our recruitment process, are we being reflective of what Bristol is as a local, uh, as, 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 as a city, and what are we like as a local employer? I think um, I was speaking to Helen earlier this morning, actually, just moving it back to more of a recruitment perspective. You know, you are seeing more of um, an EDI section on it applications that are happening direct through websites and I think more representative of where we've come from you know questions around sexual orientation race um, you know disability they're all really key questions that I think perhaps would have been absent from from the application system even sort of five years ago I would have said Helen would you? Um, yeah, I think um, I'm seeing um, a lot of candidates, you know, much more open in sharing their backgrounds mm. um, with me, whereas, you know, previously they wouldn't have been. And I think that's, you know, reflective in society, I think, I, I would hope. I think, um, you know, my daughter was keen to make sure I put on the, um, on the census that I filled in that she was um, LGBT because she wanted those... Um, funds to be allocated to people like her, you know? So whereas I think previously people of her age would have hidden that and wouldn't want people to know. Mm -hmm. So I think that shows that we're in a place where um, people are more comfortable with that, more people are um, open about that. Um, and I think that's just a brilliant thing. <laughs> you know, it can only get better. I think there's still a long, long way to go, which is why I was surprised when the government were advising to get rid of unconscious bias training. but. Um, I think um, you're definitely going in the right direction, for sure. I really enjoyed hearing what you guys are doing um, in your businesses for, um, for ED&I. &I. I think it's great that bigger businesses like Lloyd's have got specific, you know, um, people in charge of this area. You know, I've seen a lot more of my HR candidates specialising in ED&I, whereas, uh, you know, that wouldn't have been possible commercially be beforehand. I think a lot of businesses have recognised that commercially they'll thrive if they take ED&I seriously. Yeah, it's definitely, I, I don't want to use the word hot topic because I don't want to take away from the importance of what, what the subject actually is, but people are having much more of a conversation around it just because it is the right thing to do. But also, as Helen mentioned there, it's it's commercial for a business. So I would just like to say a huge thank you to all three of you for actually getting involved in this. Um, I'm not sure if you've listened to any of the other episodes. We've um, I'm pretty new to this, to be honest with you. This is only episode six. So it's um, we're hoping to have more conversations moving forward. So for me, I would just like to say a big thank you for getting involved. It's been really interesting hearing about the impact you're having on the business and just your point of view around things, you being the experts on this topic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great to meet everyone, yeah? Thanks for your time. You've been listening to RHR Talks. In order to keep updated on future episodes, make sure to subscribe via Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. The best way to be kept up to date on vacancies and content would be to follow RHR on LinkedIn and register via our website at www.rhr.co.uk. If you're looking to hire and are interested in finding out more about all of the recruitment and advertising services we offer, then do reach out directly to any of our consultants or call 0207 432 8888.